will be an act of leadership and it may result in one less person being hurt or worse. It may result in making your community a safer community. Thank you very much. a brilliant um, Chief Commissioner. Uh, really started by Christine Nixon, has been carried on by Simon and then, you know, it's terrific that we've got this kind of leadership from um, such a key person in our community. Minister, can I ask you to come and jump on the panel as well? And I'm going to invite Maya Abdubegovic, uh, <laughs> who is the CEO of Multicultural, um, In Touch Multicultural Family Violence Service and Rodney Vlay from uh, the Acting EO of uh, No Violence and Men's Referral Service and Rosie Batty who uh, doesn't need an uh, introduction uh, but is a key advocate for family violence in the community. Okay, so I'm going to start... Rosie, can I start with you? <laughs> because you've got the... The microphone in the hand. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Rosie, uh, you're a woman who has um, really been a catalyst for change in Victoria. Um, what happened to you, though, is something that we don't want to happen to anybody in our community. Um, we know that you're working really hard through the Luke Batty Foundation to address this and also in speaking. Every, everywhere I'm invited to go, they say, oh, we've got Rosie Batty to come along and speak. She's everywhere. Um, but the question I guess we want to ask is um, what, do you, what do you feel needs to be put in place for women who find themselves in abusive relationships? What would have helped you? Um, look, I think there were a number of things. Um, I think one of the most difficult is um, that agencies currently really don't communicate well with each other and organisations are not really linked. So whenever you are um, involved with the police or um, in any of the services, you have to tell your story again and again and again. So there's no coordinated responses. So I think one of the biggest things that I hope does improve in the shorter term is that ability to have um, coordinated responses where organisations can work intelligently together to understand if um, a, a woman is at risk um, and to be able to determine an escalation of risk as well. Mm. Because I think one of the things that we really do need to look at is um, you know, we don't have crystal balls, but sometimes um, there are very concerning things that are escalating that currently we can't track and we don't seem to monitor, but we just do, you know, we respond to individual events. And I think that sometimes it'd be, it's really important to be able to look at a continuum of behaviour so that there is the possibility for intervention and not minimising the risk, but actually looking at the potential for significant risk. Does mm. that help? Yes, yes. And uh, I guess um, your um, words and your experiences have really been, again, a catalyst for um, thinking across the system about what needs to be strengthened. There's been lots of discussions tonight about attitudes, mm. and I'm wondering about um, the kind of attitudes that you might have come across in your experience of family violence and um, uh, what effect that had on you? Well, I think, um, you know, certainly one of the things that really isolates you when you are a victim of family violence is that it's very difficult to share your um, relationship or your um, feelings with your friends and family um, because you know, it's very difficult for people to understand um, and you quite often feel judged or criticised. So you become isolated because you actually don't feel you can share what's going on. Um, it's something you have to deal with yourself because I think what's the, the real 
the real problem is we, we look at victim blaming. We look at questioning the woman and seeing why is she not doing certain things to stop this? Why doesn't she leave? Um, so the onus of, 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 of the problem becomes the woman's problem. When what we really should be discussing is the perpetrator and asking questions as to and discussing why he behaves in a certain manner. So I think for me, um, you know, the biggest question is why doesn't she leave? It says to me that we really don't appreciate that. Why why aren't we asking the perpetrator why is he violent? Mm -hmm. So I think we need to stop talking so much about the victim and start really having robust discussion about perpetrators. Mm -hmm because we talk a lot more about the victims than we do the perpetrators, mm -hmm. and that's very common. <coughs> but the whole thing about why doesn't she leave, you know, that, that question really does sadden me and infuriate me at the same time. Because when a woman may choose to leave, she is at the highest risk of something happening. And when Luke was killed, that was Greg's um, final act of violence and control because I had left. I didn't leave him physically because we never lived together, but I was emotionally detached from him. He had lost control over me after many years of dominating me in many, many ways. So I think what we really need to do is really respect women and children who are in very, very vulnerable positions because sometimes you may feel it's safer to stay them to leave. It's safer to put up with what you feel you know than risk the change of what might happen if you change things. So what I really would like to see in the community is a real intent to understand what it may be like to be a vulnerable woman protecting children in a position where you may not have a choice or may feel like you haven't got a choice. Um, and so supporting the victim, you know, it's a very important role that the police play. The police play a, a huge role because they're sometimes the first point of contact and response. And if the police treat you as a victim with respect, belief and support your journey, uh, that plays a huge part, a huge part in your whole ability to follow through with taking tough steps to make it the perpetrator accountable. Um, so I think that what I'd really like to see is less questioning about the victim, because one of the things that saddened me terribly was after Luke's death, that one of the questions or one of the comments that was made to me by a, another family member um, was they said, you know, what Luke, Greg did to Luke was unforgivable, but Rosie played her part too. Mm -hmm. Now, what part could I possibly have played? So, you know, that's what, those are the attitudes we have to look at. How can you, this is called victim blaming. Why didn't I do more? Why didn't I do things in a different way? How could I have possibly stopped what I didn't, no one could ever foresee, but you know that's what we do. We blame victims, but what we should be doing categorically is understanding. Greg was a violent man, and he had premeditated his act of killing my son. And the police said to me that evening, "You could never have known this was going to happen, Rosie, and you could never have stopped it. Do not ever blame yourself." So the very fact that police were able to say that to me on that night has helped me ever mm. since. So I think that those are the comments from people in the community, from family members, from people and friends, you know, they raise those questions that are really quite hurtful because the buck stops with the perpetrator. There is never an excuse and you're never at fault. And there's never a reason why, it doesn't matter whether, there's, you know, people take drugs, people take alcohol, People are mentally ill, people are depressed. It doesn't mean to say that their violence that causes their violence. You are violent because you're violent. 
and it's taking responsibility. I think. Thanks, Rosie. Maya, you're. organisation works with women every day. What do you see uh, are the issues that face women trying to lead violent relationships? I was just listening to Rosie here and I made a few notes and I was just thinking it's it's really so similar, you know, what you were just mentioning is what all our clients go through as well. Um, and there are just two things that I want to say before I go into any details. What we normally see, and I think media plays a big role in promoting that in particular within culturally and linguistically diverse communities, where you can say, you know, there is an incident, tragic incident that happens, and they put it, you know, sort of saying, oh, it's about the culture, <coughs> but when it happens in the mainstream community, it's about family violence. Mm -hmm. Well, it's about family violence in all of these cases. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's about the position of women, as the Commissioner Ray just said. It's about unequal position that women have in the societies. Mm -hmm. The way it demonstrates or manifests in different communities, there are slight differences there. But at the end of the day, it's the same issue. Um, and also when I recently watched, there was a program about your story, Rosie, and you talked about that, um, that you felt isolated and you didn't have anyone to share that with. And I was thinking, that's it, that's what happens with all of our clients. They're isolated because they don't have their family here with them. And, they, and here is a woman that can speak language. You don't have the language barrier, yet you felt that isolation and you mm -hmm. felt not being able to share that story. So just going back to what you just said, I just said, I think those are, those, the issues are exactly the same. You have to retell your story so many times when you go to different services. If you don't speak English, then how you do that? Um, isolation, you don't have your family. For a lot of our clients, they come here, they're newly arrived. A lot of them come as um, a spouse, marrying someone who is a citizen. Um, they don't have anyone here. There is only one person in the whole country that they know, and that might be that abusive partner. They don't know the system, they don't know the language, there are no networks, there is no one there to go to and to talk to them. Um,